Welcome to All Things Cardio-Oncology. My name is Steve Casella. I'm the Executive Director of ICOS, and in this podcast, you'll hear from a diverse representation from within our community. We want you to be both informed and inspired by their stories and experiences, and we're so glad that you've joined us today. Thank you all for joining us today. I want to welcome my co-host, Dr. Daniel Lenahan, who's one of the founders of ICOS and a regular on this podcast, along with uh, Dr. Arjun Ghosh. Uh, Dr. Ghosh is in London, and he is also a regular co-host on this program. And today, we're really thankful to have with us two of our colleagues from Brazil. Brazil is one of our most active and important global chapters in the International Cardio-Oncology Society. So we're really excited to hear about the work that they're doing today. And our focus on this program will be amyloidosis in particular. But first, I want to say hello to Dr. Roberta Soar, who is a hematologist at the Sao Paulo Cancer Institute and the University of Sao Paulo. So welcome, Roberta. Hi, hello. It's a pleasure to be here today. And thank you for inviting me to join you. Uh, it's, it's also a pleasure to talk about amyloidosis. So as Steve uh, has just said, I'm a hematologist and I work with focus on oncohematology and most gamma, uh, monoclonal gammopathies. And that's why I'm very interested in AL amyloidosis as well. Great. And her colleague, uh, Dr. Ariana Macedo, is the chair of cardio-oncology clinic at uh, Santa Casa and also in Sao Paulo and a researcher at the Brazilian Clinical Research Institute. And she is uh, fresh off her dissertation defense. So congratulations, Ariana, and welcome. Thank you, Stephen. Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here to talk about uh, amyloidosis that I feel that uh, uh, a lot of cardiologists and hematologists, we share this love with amyloid, and it's something that we cannot explain, but we just love it. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm a cardiologist, and I work with cardio-oncology. I've been working with cardio-oncology in the last 10, 11 years. And um, since I was introduced to the amyloid world, I got, got in love with this, and I feel that... Uh, and now we have more options to these patients and uh, we really need to improve the diagnosis and the treatment for these very unique uh, patients uh, that we will found everywhere in our clinic. So I I'm a coordinator of uh, the amyloid amyloidosis center in Santa Casa uh, of Sao Paulo. We have a uh, a group of uh, cardiologists and the neurologists and the nephrologists working with these patients. And um, I hope we got more and more amyloid centers around the world. And I feel that this is something that the ICOS has helping a lot of people to work better in this field. So thank you. Thank you again for having me here today. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. And I wonder if you could both tell us sort of what sparked your initial interest in this disease. It's a relatively uncommon condition. So I wonder what was it that got you interested in treating patients with this condition? Uh, Roberta, you want to tell us a little bit more about that? And sure. As I said before, I work mainly with oncohematology and with focus in monoclonal, monoclonal gammopathies. So among patients with multiple myeloma, we've seen many patients that are uh, a bit different of the, the common patient that uh, is diagnosed with multiple myeloma because this disease uh, does not uh, present itself with an organic dysfunction. So we, we started to see many patients that had this presentation and so we, we diagnosed, we were able to diagnose the condition of uh, amyloidosis. But um, unfortunately, here we can talk about this with more details um, a little further. But we have um, problems with access um, to medications. And so that's why I've got interested because it seemed to me that it was. Um, a medical condition that needed attention from a, a special group of physicians. And they, they are very 
frail patients. So they also need our close attention. And that's why I, I, I decided to look with a, a, in a different way for this group of patients. Thanks for that uh, context and background. Ariana, what about you? How did you get initially interested in this field? Yes, um, I, uh, when I start the working with cardio-oncology, I start, of course, uh, uh, receiving patients from the breast uh, cancer oncologists and uh, prostate cancer oncologists, and eventually from the hematologists in the very early uh, when we start to have this, um, this special look into uh, oncology patients. And I remember clearly when I received the first amyloid patient and uh, referred by a hematologist. In that time, I was not in Sao Paulo. I was in Belo Horizonte when I was working. Uh, so I remember that I, I looked at, at the, that patient and it, and it was uh, AL amyloidosis and uh, the, the hematologist has asked me to see if uh, the the treatment were going well, doing well regarding the cardiovascular manifestations, and um, and I was I, I confess that I was a little bit lost in that moment because I was not so aware how important the cardiologist and the response in the card in the uh, in the heart could be. Um, a measure of efficiency for the AL amyloidosis treatment. So in that moment, I start to uh, realize how we need to be together with the hematologist. And after this first patient, um, as we don't have so many cardiologists, I feel interested and in study these kind of patients and uh, to be close to them. I started uh, uh, receiving patients from other hematologists. And uh, when I was back into Sao Paulo, uh, I, uh, the, the amyloid world was different with the TTR amyloidosis treatment, new treatment. So it was easier to, to get more people involved in this field. So um, they're responsible for my, um, my passion for amyloidosis. It was a hematologist that sent me the first patient. And now uh, in, in, uh, when you start studying and seeing these patients and seeing how challenging can be uh, the diagnosis and, uh, and also how you can help them to live better, I feel that uh, we, you, you just start to see more and more and uh, helping these these patients. And Arjun, I know that this is also an area where you have done some work. Um, maybe tell us a little bit, just briefly, your interest in this field. And then you can have some follow up questions for our guests. Sure. Thanks a lot, uh, Steve. Yeah. So I am involved with the local uh, amyloid service, both at uh, Bart's Heart Center and at University College London Hospital. And we have a close affiliation with the National Amyloid Center, where there have been a number of international and uh, national uh, research trials and studies. So this is something that um, I have been more closely involved with uh, with the passing of, uh, of time in cardio-oncology. Great. Do you have some questions for our panelists? Sure. Um, so, uh, Roberta, if I could uh, start. Uh, with you. Um, we know that uh, you're part of the uh, ICOS working group on amyloidosis and um, this question thereafter to, to Ariane as well. Uh, how did you get involved and, and what do you hope to achieve with the ICOS working group? So uh, thank you for the question, Arjun. I was actually involved because I, I was invited by, by a group of of cardiologists that work with me uh, in Sao Paulo Cancer Institute. And we shared many patients with this condition. And actually one of these cardiologists uh, was close to the, to the ICOS. And so she, she, she asked me, would you be interested in joining a group of study and discussions and meetings to, to talk about and promote awareness? Um, in this field of amyloidosis, and and I said yes, yeah, sure, because uh, I'm I'm planning my my studies, and I 
I'm doing my my PhD, my PhD in this field of amyloidosis, focusing on diagnosis. And actually, I'm I'm taking some biopsy um, from patients that unfortunately uh, are are now de uh, dead. But I'm trying to, to the, the the mass spectrometry and compare the results with the diagnosis that we have made when these patients were alive based on the clinical picture scenario that we've, we've seen and based on the, um, the exams that and tests that we have we had uh, in that moment. So I'm trying to, to do some work mainly in this field of diagnosis. And, and so I said, yes, it's my, my field of interest that I sure I want to join the, the ICOS group to talk and study and share. Uh, opinions and experience uh, in amyloidosis, and I think that um, the ICOS meetings um, brings me um, experience, and it's very nice to share and to know how people do in their countries. I know that uh, Ariane and I, um, we are um, mainly, I think the 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 only people in this group that are outside of America and Europe. And no, sorry, there are some people from Japan also. But in Latin America, we both represent our our country and our region, and we have social difficulties that may um, may um, in in some way uh, delay in in a way our diagnosis. And so we have some some work to do. And it's it's nice to to share experiences and, and knowledge and with ICOs. Great, and uh, Ariane, from your point of view, I mean, it must be great to have a you know hematologist in in the working group to have that you know, real cardio oncology you know collaboration. I mean, what are your thoughts on that, and what do you hope the ICOs uh, working group can achieve? Yes, uh, I was um, I, I was volunteered to take part of the group when I <laughs> realized that uh, we are uh, forming these working groups, and I asked to to, to join in. And um, I feel that the presence not only from uh, of uh, Roberta, but also all the great hematologists that we have with us, also is so important. And uh, we learn in every meeting <laughs> a lot about subtypes of uh, not only TTR, but uh, uh, mutations and uh, all uh, varieties of uh, manifestations. So we share experiences. We try to get solutions for uh, our difficulties. We, and we learn about a lot to each other. We discuss cases about uh, the hard, very, very hard, difficult cases because uh, we realize that when it's difficult for one of us, maybe it's difficult for everyone, but always we have someone that had seen a patient similar or have heard about someone that knows someone that knows more about this disease. So really it's very important. And more than that, uh, we are acting uh, with uh, uh, educational activities. That's great. We had the last, uh, the first activity last year that was amazing and uh, we have also planning other activities and also the build of uh, ICOS uh, amyloid excellence centers and uh, I don't know Steve if I could say this now that <laughs> it was keeping <laughs> secret a work in progress, no, <laughs> work no in progress. <laughs> and that uh, we have been work, uh, working um, in this excellent centers to get all the criteria to have them and to help uh, other colleagues, hematologists, cardiologists, and all the specialities involved in this care of these patients to improve the, their centers and even create one, a new one. That's So I'm very, very honored to take part in the ICUS amyloid group. Right. So it seems that you definitely both and all the members have your hands full with a lot of different uh, initiatives from the education and uh, training perspective. So, so that's great. Um, and I think that um, both uh, you and Roberta have already touched a little bit upon this. 
But um, maybe, Ariane, if I could start with you, what do you feel is different um, about Brazil in terms of, you know, the diagnosis and management of, of amyloid compared to, you know, many of the other countries in, say, America or Europe that you mentioned in, in the panel uh, or in the working group? What's the difference for Brazil? Yes, I feel that the, we have some... Uh, every country, and I feel in the world, uh, has his own difficulties in the health system. There is not a perfect one. I feel that the England system is close to the perfection <laughs> for us. Our public health system was inspired in the NHS system. So we uh, really look up uh, your health system. And uh, But we know that there are some difficulties as well. In Brazil, we have two big differences in, uh, in access not only to exams, but also to treatment. I feel that the, we are one step behind. We don't make the diagnosis of these patients, not only because the doctors are not aware yet, it has been proving. We need to recognize that now we talk more about amyloidosis. We have more people thinking about uh, and all the uh, medical schools and all the cardiology training courses are having the amyloid topic in their agenda and, and as, as an important topic. So in Brazil, I feel, and uh, probably Roberta will agree with me, that the access to the diagnosed methods, uh, not only image, but uh, biopsy and um, a more precise diagnosis of uh, amyloidosis, and of course, access to the treatment. But um, I feel that the algorithm of having a diagnosis, a final diagnosis, it's really missing here. Uh, we have for the polyneuropathy, we have a public algorithm published by our health, uh, C, uh, health group and our government. But for the, cardio, the cardiovascular manifestations, we don't have it, it yet. So for me, is that access to diagnosis and treatment. Great. Thanks, uh, Ariane. And maybe uh, along the, the same lines, uh, Roberta, this, uh, when I talk to some, some colleagues in developing countries about cardiac amyloid, they, they often say that, well, it's a rare condition, it's an expensive condition to treat. Um, you know, we have other priorities that we might need to focus on. So, you know, what is your feeling about this, Roberta? And, you know, how best can we um, encourage more people in developing countries that, you know, cardiac amyloid is a problem and, you know, there does need to be some, some efforts to, to helping these patients? So first, uh, I think that all of us might agree that cardiac amyloidosis is an unmet medical condition. So, uh, first of all, I think that medical education, raising medical awareness for this condition is uh, a key factor and a key uh, strategy for us to increase diagnosis. And we say that our amyloidosis is a rare disease, but all of us, we know that it's under-recognized and under-diagnosed. So, it's not so rare, as people say. And First of, of all, I think that that's it, medical education and educational events. And like Ariane just said, uh, putting this, um, this, this topic in, in medical schools. I'm, I, I heard the first, uh, the, the first time I heard of melidosis, I was already an hematologist. So I, I didn't heard about it in my um, in my university and even in my my clinical um, my my internal medicine training i i didn't see any patient with this condition so this is the first uh, second the diagnostic journey of these patients we may improve the access of exams we may uh, build algorithms just to make it more easy for 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 medical community how are uh, which are the steps to follow in the diagnostic process which test we can perform before the other uh, 
and putting this um, more clear for the, the clinicians, not only cardiologists, hematologists, I wouldn't say because we are maybe the last um, specialty to, to see this patient. So we have to train um, gastroenterologists, neurologists, nephrologists, uh, internal medicine uh, practitioners, general practitioners, not only cardiologists. And putting this more clear, the diagnostic process and making shorter the diagnostic journey of the patients for don't for for we we don't have many uh, delays in diagnosis because we know that it's worse for our patients and we have many problem in access um, not, not only a cardiac MRI or an, a biopsy but we have tests like free light chains we don't have this. Um, available in many, many services. So that's something that we need to improve. And finally, uh, we, may, we may improve also the, the access um, to treatment. So many new drugs that we, we don't have in the public system and in the private system, yes, we, we have, but uh, we, we may improve this this issue in access to medications. Okay, so I guess uh, just to summarize then, we're talking about increasing awareness amongst medical students, amongst doctors, amongst the public, and also trying to institute some kind of, you know, governmental change, I guess, to, to increase, you know, funding for, you know, helping diagnose and manage uh, these patients. I think that's a challenge, not just uh, in developing countries, but in very, in many, you know, developed countries as well. You know, there are similar challenges. If you or your institution would like to have credentials that confirm your qualifications as a cardio-oncologist or a cardio-oncology center of excellence, we encourage you to consider applying for our certification exam in cardio-oncology or our certification for centers of excellence. These are the only certifications currently available in this field, and it's a special opportunity for you or your institution to distinguish yourself, recognizing your expertise in the field. More information about both these opportunities can be found at ic-os.org, or you can email directoricos at gmail.com for more information. I would just add, I, I listened to what Roberta just said, and, you know, I think that, and, and Arjun, what you just said, you know, we we have had this conversation on our amyloidosis working group that even in Canada, for example, you know, they can't really prescribe to famitis very easily. And that would be a sort of a standard go-to sort of medication for ATTR, for example. But uh, we also know that the list price in the United States is 225000 per year. And I don't know what it is in the UK, but the, so in Canada, they they have great difficulty even just getting sort of standard medicines. I mean, it's similar restricted um, prescribing in the UK as well, only via the National Amyloid Centre. So I think, you know, what Brazil may be struggling with uh, is common to many areas, let me just say. So that's a good segue, I think, to the question of research. I wonder if each of you could tell us a little bit about sort of what research excites you in the field currently, and are you involved in any particular research projects currently? Well, uh, I feel that uh, Roberta has uh, talked about her PhD thesis. That's a very exciting uh, project. Uh, she will describe more um, further, but um, for, uh, in my in my group, we are now working in a register. It's not only my group, but in Brazil, we have now the React uh, register that we are trying to map the amyloid centers and to describe the profile of our TTR patients with it, that are diagnosed 
Uh, it's a project that uh, uh, our leader is Professor Fabio Fernandes from the Hart Institute of Sao Paulo University that has joined more than, I feel that now we are uh, uh, 15 centers, um, amyloid set centers that will um, get their patients on, the patients with the ATTR amyloidose cardiomyopathy to get the profile of these patients because we really don't know uh, how they present to us, mainly in the Brazilian population because we have um, a very important Portuguese uh, influence. Uh, so for us, uh, it's very, it's, it's common to find the VAL30, um, VAL50 uh, mutations because of our ancestry that uh, Brazil was colonized by the by Portuguese, so we have this in our um, blood. So uh, how many of these patients had this mutation and how they are, They were, what were the journey to be diagnosed? So we, we are in this step now in, in building this group and now we are, active, uh, we are active in this research. Professor uh, Fernandes has been uh, uh, doing a, a great leader in this field. And uh, we hope to have this profile of at least of the Brazilian uh, patients with uh, ATTR cardiomyopathy. So uh, that's something that we are working uh, now uh, uh, regarding this topic. So I, I have already talked about my, my PhD project on my spectrometry and diagnosis. But besides this, I, I also... Um, I'm also involved in this kind of, of research that Ariane just told, and uh, I was able to, to publish in, in uh, JACC, uh, Cardio Oncology, our experience of Sao Paulo University and the Heart and the Cancer Institute comparing uh, ATTR and AL patients. And we, we've seen that we have uh, an almost one year of delay in diagnosis and AL patients were diagnosed um, earlier than, than ATTR, maybe because of this, the, the direct cardiotoxicity of light chains. And that was an interesting um, study that we've made. And also I was involved in the, um, the building of the position statement on cardiac amyloidosis by the Brazilian uh, Society of Cardiology. And I think this is part of that educational program that we are just talking um, about. Yeah, I think the uh, both uh, Roberta and Ariane have been uh, very involved in our ICOS efforts in regards to raising awareness of amyloidosis. And uh, we did a, a seminar series or webinar series uh, last year, and Roberta was a big part of that. And uh, and I, I'm sure that Ariane will be involved uh, going forward this year. I think that, you know, we uh, obviously uh, Brazil, because of the Portuguese heritage, has a uh, higher incidence of uh, hereditary type TTR, but also the condition in general is is uh, uh, widely considered. And I think that we need to, when we look at uh, studies in, in amyloidosis around the world, there usually is quite a lot of participation from Brazil. So I think that understanding what's happening in Brazil is really important to all of us. And uh, it, it was interesting also one of the, the points that I think both Roberta and Ariane both made about you know, managing AL amyloid patients and the you know, ATTR amyloid patients. Now, I know that in different centers around the world, it can be different. Some are managed by you know, hematologists more closely, some often by you know, um, heart, muscle or cardiomyopathy teams. So I just wanted to know, you know what it's like in your centers and you know, what would be be a good model because you know sometimes you know one patient can have two types of amyloid rarely as well so you know i mean maybe roberta if i start with you about uh, this question oh it's kind of funny because uh, as an hematologist 
maybe you would expect to hear me that I just treat AAL patients. But believe me, I have some cardiologists that send me patients saying this is a TTR amyloidosis. So that's amyloidosis. You know about it. I don't know about it. So <laughs> take this patient for you and take care well, of him. And R- so Roberta, I can say the same thing happens in the U.S. So, so I think if you ever identify that you're willing to take on these patients and try to figure it out, then uh, suddenly you become best friends of all of your colleagues who don't want to deal with it. So, yes, that's it. It's kind of funny, but uh, I try to to do my best mainly in the diagnostic process because uh, this is something that all of us must do to identify the correct subtype. And if I identify that it's not AL and I won't treat this patient. I refer this patient to a cardiologist that is aware and and knows how to to take care of this patient because, of course, I'm not a cardiologist. But uh, I think the key factor here is that working together uh, is essential and is the the key factor to to give our patients um, a better care. So. Um, we won't do anything alone talking about amyloidosis, even if I have an AL patient, of course, I will, I will refer this patient to the cardiologist because I, I don't know how to manage the, the, the cardiomyopathy. So uh, working together and studying together and sharing together our experience, our doubts. And I think it's, it's every, every time we do it, we are learning together and we are doing better that we we could do alone. Totally agree with that. Ariane, what is what is your experience of that? Yes, it's very similar to Roberta experience. Uh, usually uh, depends from where the patient were coming. I mean, um, maybe it's uh, it's found in a, in a uh, image exam. So they come to me and I for, for to my group and we start excluding AL and after that uh, uh, referring the patient to hematologist in case it's sus- uh, the suspicion of AL is high based on the initial exams. But also we have the inverse. We have sometimes patients uh, that the hematologists are confused, not confused, but they are suspecting of the cardiomyopathy associated that we know how important it is to, to know that to the treatment. So it's interesting because they come, they uh, usually, they send the patient with ECO, with MRI. So I feel that oh, now we are really working together because they know what, what I will be asking and that uh, they anticipate these exams. I feel that this uh, synchrony of uh, what we are thinking What's important for me and also for the hematology, it's very important. But usually the patient with AL are uh, being primarily with the hematologist and we uh, follow to get, follow, we, we are used to follow them together, uh, looking um, at the cardiomyopathy and all the, uh, all the things. But we, are, we have some experience very shortly. We are closing. We are near to the end of the, this podcast. But uh, what we have sharing uh, with the hematologist team, uh, hematologic team is sometimes access to different exams. For example, we have here in Brazil, if you, I don't know if it's the same in US, in England, some private uh, um, uh, pharma companies providing exams to make the, the, the diagnosis. So we can uh, collect the genetic test free for free in this uh, patient program. And uh, we can use this to improve the diagnosis. And uh, we have sometimes this, uh, uh, some uh, programs to dermatologists, for example, mass expectometry for uh, the diagnosis of uh, AL, but I have the genetic test for diagnosis TTR amyloidosis. So sometimes we, we can share these programs uh, to improve the diagnosis. So really it's important to work together, but usually hematologist gets the AL. Yeah, I think that it's 
uh, one of the things that we have been working on as a as a group is what is it what exactly is a center of excellence and how do they you know sort of behave together and i think that you know your experience in brazil is is very similar to at least uh, what what is done in the us and presumably what's done in the uk but you know we have a lot of direct input with the uh, hematology and neurology colleagues and having the meeting every couple of weeks to kind of go through patient issues is really helpful. It, it's 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 veg, very educational for me personally, and uh, I think that I really enjoy that that interaction with other colleagues. So I don't know, uh, Arjun, if you've uh, had a similar experience. Yeah, I think actually experiences seem to be very similar. Uh, in all the different you know countries and continents, actually, so very much a team-based approach, close collaboration with hemato oncologists, and I think we we also have you know hemato oncologists at the National Amyloid Center who closely do look at the ATTR patients as well, al- al- along with with the cardiologists. I think you know as as you mentioned, Dan, and as uh, the other speakers have mentioned, the multidisciplinary approach and having those regular you know meetings with those other specialties has to be the key to managing these complex patients so steve uh, do you want to summarize what we've talked about today yeah i really appreciate uh both ariana and roberta thank you for uh your time and your expertise i think uh as we always say in cardio oncology team 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 collaboration across disciplines that's really the key um, to the best in patient care. So you both have really accented that today, and we appreciate that. And I'll put um, some links in the show notes to the educational programs that we referenced. And thank you both for your time today. And thanks, Dan and Arjun, for your time. For more information about ICOS, you can go to ic-os.org where you'll find more information about all of our programs, including our weekly webinars, our board certification exam, and other resources that we know you'll find helpful. Thanks for joining us today, and we hope to hear from you soon.